I'm very excited to, to introduce Zoe and Christopher from uh, MedStar Health. I, I last year before uh, you know everything got locked down, I had the opportunity to go visit Christopher at, at a MedStar's uh, MedStar Health, their National Center for Human Factors, and their uh, Cytel lab for where they actually conduct you know all sorts of fantastic healthcare research and training and simulation um, and you know, the work that they do there, uh, uh, you know, it, it's really directly to the practitioners and to the patients with lots of benefit. Um, so, you know, with that, I, you know, I, I think I saw Christopher post something about their, their, their research on Twitter, and I was thinking, wow, that would be, a, you know, fantastic talk. And then Christopher very graciously volunteered to help put it together, and, and Zoe joined in, which, uh, uh, you know, again, I, I can't wait to see this. Um, just as a... a uh, you know, one final bit, we are going to be recording tonight's presentation, so we'll make that available uh, afterwards. But with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Christopher and Zoe for tonight's presentation. And let me change the host over here. And there we go. Excellent. Thank you, Jordan. All right, let me get these slides up here real quick. As I can get out. Hold on a second. All right, take a quick look at Catalina while I get these slides up here. Okay. And are you seeing just the slide? Yeah, I can see the slide. All right, excellent. Well, again, uh, Jordan, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Moro and uh, Media Barn for this opportunity to come and, and talk to you guys. Um, this has been a, a project that Zoe and I have, been, uh, have conducted during uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and we're really, really excited to come in and talk to you about our process tonight. Um, so without further ado, let me go over the agenda real quick. It'd be a real quick introduction about us uh, and about MedStar Health. Uh, then we're going to go into a little bit about the pandemic, something not a lot of people have heard of recently, right? Then we're going to talk about the project itself, um, the plan, how we assembled our team into conducting the actual in-person testing, uh, lessons that we took away from it, and then uh, a Q&A. We do have a little extra um, uh, slide for kind of the, the takeaways that we had from um, our experience uh, conducting user testing in the pandemic. Uh, to, so to start off a little bit about us, and I'm going to let uh, Zoe go ahead and tell uh, a little bit about her. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Zoe Pruitt, and I am a human factor specialist with the National Center for Human Factors in Healthcare. Um, I have my bachelor's in cognitive science and a master's in human factors and applied cognition. And my work at the center mainly focuses on the usability of medical devices. All right, and my name is Christopher Bonk. Um, I'm a research scientist and clinical human factor specialist. Um, at MedStar Health. I also have a background uh, in emergency room nursing, uh, which I worked about four and a half years at uh, Baltimore Washington Medical Center in, uh, in the state of Maryland. So coming to, um, oh, there we go. Wait. There we are. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about MedStar itself. So MedStar, at MedStar, uh, our human factors group, um, we study human capabilities and designing technology systems and processes to meet capabilities for safety, efficiency, and quality, um, both with the practitioner and with the patient in mind. Um, our team is about 30 or so um, people, amazing, amazing people to be at that. Uh, and we have a, a massive background um, that ranges from experts in human factors and health inequity uh, and health equities. Um, aerospace engineering. Uh, we do on our team have a variety of clinicians and practitioners from nursing um, to palliative care to emergency medicine to occupational health. Um, so we do have a, a wide variety of health experts that are on our team as well. Uh, a lot of our work goes from uh, applied research where we work with grants and contracts that range from a variety of different government entities um, we also have usability services where we conduct um, medical device testing, which we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, safety integration, where we have safety consults by hospital. Um, and then we have education and out outreach, uh, where we have close connections with Georgetown University, Catholic University, uh, where we conduct workshops, 
uh, and some of our staff actually teaches classes there as well. Just a quick go over, this is kind of some of the federal agencies, foundations, universities, societies, corporations that um, we've had the luxury of working with um, and continue to uh, both on a contract and a, a grant basis. So let's talk about the pandemic. <laughs> so first of all, this kind of uh, is, is to just give an overview, right? Uh, something that we are all very knowledgeable in. Um, and the, the whole goal of this slide is to basically talk about what influenced our protocol changes, right? Um, so why is COVID a risk specific, specifically to user testing um, and to us at, at the center, right? So, so COVID-19, it's a respiratory virus uh, that is spread through droplets, which are highly contagious if exposed. Um, it's spread through sneezing, coughing, and talking. And mostly a high percentage uh, of the virus is spread through droplets, so close contact, right? Um, though there has been some patterns that have been seen of, of this aerosolization, right? So the pronunciation uh, of vowels and loud speech that uh, some research has recently shown can aerosolize some of the virus, hence mandatory mask wearing, uh, washing hands and, and social distancing. And similar to the seasonal flu, it is a little more contagious that we're, we're finding out, right? And so it's continuing to mutate. So this is something that we always need to keep in mind uh, when talking about protocol changes uh, in, the, in the times of a pandemic. And this slide is to give you a little bit of, of information about where we did our testing or what time we did our testing. So this map looks at um, a, the new cases um, that were documented both in DC or both in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, and so you can see from day zero all the way on the left side uh, is where they started counting new cases. And so we had that initial bump and then it kind of evened out a little bit and we had that comfort level. So we decided to go ahead with testing right before the massive spike uh, that, that happened later in the year. Um, and so we did conduct our testing on the 28th and the 29th of, of October in 2020. So as we go forward, just keep in mind that this was before a lot of the, the, the spike in new cases um, where we did start to uh, figure out a little bit more about, about protocols and, and what to look for. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Zoe to talk about the project. Yeah, so while the pandemic initially stalled our usability testing of the device, our contracts were quickly coming to a close, deadlines were approaching, and things just had to get done. And so with this in mind, we began moving forward with a formative evaluation of the device. Next slide. So the medical device in question is a virtual reality software for the treatment of a medical condition. I know I'm being vague, but for NDA reasons, I can't describe the software's purpose in any more detail. Uh, but essentially, the user would put on a headset and hold controllers while they walked through this virtual treatment program. The goal of our testing was to conduct a formative evaluation of the software with representative users to assess if the device uh, meets FDA criteria. Uh, the nature of the product did introduce some very unique challenges and any product that we look at um, um, uh, during a pandemic will have its own unique <laughs> uh, flavor to it that introduces new issues. The big thing for this project was the headset itself. So participants would need to physically wear something on their face, sweat in it, breathe on it um, to complete testing. And to make matters a little bit worse, uh, if you've um, ever used the Oculus Quest, um, the headset is made of this fabric component that makes it really difficult to clean. The virtual reality environment is also um, not great for social distancing. Of course, while you're wearing the headset itself, you can't see the people around you and avoid them. And that was something uh, we also saw as a potential issue uh, where the participant may get too close to the moderator on accident. Um, and so all of these were things that we started thinking about and noodling around in our head um, when we um, knew that we had to use this specific device in our test. So now that we understand the device and the challenges that it may pose, it's time to actually plan the testing, right? So planning is an essential part of, of any research endeavor, usability testing included. Uh, but this time we're planning more for more than just the testing itself, right? We need to put in safety barriers in place to make ourselves safe as well as the participants. The first step was to assemble a team of people to be in person on the day of testing. Who's actually going to moderate? Who's going to prepare the room, corral the participants, et cetera? So for this step, we determined that it would be best for our usability experts to opt in to participate in testing. 
there are many reasons why someone might be uncomfortable testing in person, right? From family situations to health conditions. So we felt that it was important to allow people to make that decision for themselves if they were comfortable um, doing usability testing in person or not. Of course, just because people aren't there on the day of testing doesn't mean that they can't help out with other parts of the usability process. There's the moderator guide that needs to be written, the final report, the data needs to be cleaned, and all of that can be accomplished from the safety of one's home. So those who aren't comfortable testing in person can still participate in the process. Next, um, once we had our team assembled, we wanted to make sure that our team members and the participants would be as safe as possible during the testing process. So this meant researching the industry guidelines, um, looking at the World Health Organization, the CDC to understand what safety measures we should really be taking. Um, the federal guidelines can easily be found on the CDC website, but I also encourage you to look at the DC coronavirus website. It has a lot of really good local data. Um, it was helpful for us for sure. Um, we need to abide by government guidelines, of course, uh, but because we work for a healthcare organization, we also need to abide by our company's policies. Next. Um, while the government regulations offer suggestions, encouragement uh, to follow guidelines, our company's policies were much more cut and dry. Do this always or in these situations, uh, no wiggle room. So, you know, nine, 10 months into the pandemic, none of these policies will be at all surprising to you, but I'm gonna go through the main five very quickly, just so that we're all on the same page. Like what guidelines were we following when we were designing our testing? Number one, of course, is masks. Uh, the CDC recommends mask wearing to minimize the spread of viruses. And uh, our company, uh, specifically MedStar Health, has very strict guidelines about when and who should be wearing masks everyone, all the time, essentially. Uh, um, and masks are most uh, effective at preventing the spread of COVID when they are worn by the infected party. So they prevent the viral droplet from entering the air and landing on the passerby. In addition to masks, the industry also recommends hand washing and hand sanitizing. The CDC recommends a specific strength of hand sanitizer greater than 60% alcohol content. And so that was something we needed to know when we were buying our supplies. Um, hand washing and hand sanitizing is important because if someone comes into contact with a virus, they need to wash off their hands before touching their eyes, their nose, their mouth, any membrane surface. Otherwise, they can contract the virus. Then there's social distancing, standing six feet apart from others, of course, um, so that droplets aren't spread from person to person. Next, uh, viral droplets can spread through the air, but they can also live on surfaces. And if people touch an infected surface and then touch their face, they can contract the virus. Or as we were particularly concerned about, if someone puts on, an infected person puts on a headset and then the same headset is put on a healthy person, they could contract the virus. And then lastly, if people have COVID or any potential COVID symptoms, they should stay home. Of course, if you aren't around others, you can't spread the virus. So these were the five main tenets of COVID virus protection that we were following. And so based on these recommendations, we create a list of supplies that we would need to abide by these guidelines as best as possible. Uh, this meant buying the obvious supplies like masks, hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes, um, but we also bought tape to mark off areas of the room to help social distancing between the participant and the moderator. Um, and we also bought a silicone cover for our VR headset to fix that fabric problem that would have made it really difficult to clean. Um, so, uh, Chris, you can take it away. Absolutely. Thanks, Zoe. So now we have the why, right? So now we're going to go into the how. So how did we take these COVID-19 guidelines that we extensively researched and looked through and found the ones that, that fit our design exactly? How did we then implement that? So. Let me start off first by before COVID-19, those glorious days before COVID-19, where we had this very, very simple list, right? So we had the confirmation call initially to the participant before they arrived. When they arrived, we uh, are work in a building where we are also part of a school. So they had to do an ID check and a short background check. Then we walk them to the room, complete consent forms, usually on a digital tablet to make it easier to put into forms. And then we'd start the testing. We do the introduction, debriefing, all of the things required for testing. And then when the participant left, we were able to reset the room quickly, change the batteries, change the cards, 
reset, reset everything, right? Well, during COVID kind of adds a couple steps. So before we were looking at maybe at most three steps per, per um, area. Now we're looking at almost six steps per area, right? So now I'm gonna go through each and every step and how we changed the steps to become uh, compliant to the guidelines that, that we looked at. So first was prior to arrival. So where we normally just have a confirmation call, we wanted the explanation of the building protocol to be available to the participant. So it's written in easy to understand language and it describes the process with complete transparency of what the participant will expect when they arrive to the building, right? So all visitors in non-clinical locations are expected to wear a personal mask, masks worn at all times, perform hand hygiene, and practicing physical distancing. So those were kind of the primary areas that we wanted the participant to know before they arrived uh, at our office. And it was, was given to them about 24 to 48 hours prior to their arrival. So they were understanding what exactly to expect when they arrived. Also, what we had for them was a symptom checker. Uh, one of the things that our hospital has actually, or the hospital system has actually implemented is a symptom checker for employees before they arrive to the hospital to say that they don't have any chills, coughing, sore throat, um, and that they don't need to go to occupational health before they arrive at the hospital. And this is something that we implemented for our participants. So each question here describes a different step. So question one was currently, do you have any symptoms of the respiratory infection? Um, and then it lists some symptoms. And if they did have those symptoms, then they weren't really allowed to participate because those were symptoms of a, a possible COVID-19 infection. If not, they go on to the next question, which is, have you been exposed to someone who was tested po positive or, or diagnosed with COVID-19? And evidence was showing that if you were exposed to somebody with COVID-19 because of how highly contagious COVID-19 is, they could possibly contract it, be asymptomatic, but still be contagious, putting our team at risk uh, and other participants at risk. So if they answered yes to that, then they weren't allowed to participate. And then question three is, have you traveled to any of the listed COVID-19 hotspots in the last 14 days? And again, this is before the massive spike. So when there were hotspots from state to state, um, with Florida, a couple others that were, that were included in those hotspots. And if you traveled to those spots, did you quarantine um, at least 14 days when you arrived back at home? And if you um, did travel to those, those hotspots in the last 14 days, then you weren't allowed to participate. But if not, then you were allowed to participate. And it gave us the ability to, to rule out any possibilities of, of breaking in those protocols. The next, of course, is wearing a mask. Uh, they mandated to wear a mask, but we also implemented something else. It was called uh, the face mask swap. So if you arrived with a cloth mask, which is shown to protect, um, there are some cloth masks that don't really fit properly, right? Or can have uh, be old or, or have some areas for exposure. What we did is we bought a whole bunch of surgical masks that were standardized. And if they did have a cloth mask, we handed them a fresh one um, and asked them to swap. Uh, and then they can swap back to their cloth mask after participating and after they left the building. It gave us as a team uh, the peace of mind that we were protected at all times uh, and that there wasn't, again, a break in protocol if there was a cloth mask that could possibly cause some exposure. Uh, during the escorting from the check-in desk to the testing room, we tried to practice social distancing as much as possible. We did have an elevator that was a little tight but we were able to uh, only have two people in the elevator at all times uh, and socially distance between each other. So we were wearing masks and we're distanced about as far as we could from each other uh, in the elevator. That was probably the, the hardest thing to maintain uh, in terms of social distancing. And of course, hand sanitizing. We had hand sanitizer at the, um, when they checked in, when they got to the room, when they started testing, after they tested, when they left the room and before they left the building. So it was hand sanitized pretty much every, every step of the way. Nest was filling out forms. So where we, we used to have a, a consent form where they would use a tablet um, to complete the steps, we took the process that a lot of restaurants are now uh, using, which are using paper menus, right? So we decided to do the same thing with paper forms. Uh, it reduced the need to clean the tablet in between every single participant. Um, and it also offered the ability to throw away paper forms that could possibly contaminate. If you have somebody who's working on something and sneezes and, you know, sneezes onto the document, well, you don't really want to touch those documents, right? 
Um, so it gave us the ability to give them new documents um, in case anything like that happened. Demographic forms were the same exact way. Um, we gave them paper documents that they could then um, fill out and each participant was actually given their own folder um, to keep those documents in while they were visiting uh, our office. So they would fill out the forms, they would go into their particular folder and after each participant uh, at the end of the day, we would go up um, and Zoe would actually scan each individual document. So we had a digital copy of each document just in case they were lost. Our next step is actual testing and how did we arrange our space to allow for appropriate distancing? This was one of the biggest talked about parts um, of our testing process uh, that we had to go through a lot of planning in order to figure out. So to consider, we had one participant, one moderator and one note taker that were going to be um, together, right? In, in close prox relative close proximity. Um, participants, like Zoe said, they can't see each other um, or any other individuals when they have the VR mask on, which makes it difficult to social distance. And then we also had the ability, which was great, to cast the VR headset to a TV in the observation room. So if you see on the right side, we actually have this fill big room on the bottom, and then we have the observation room on the top, and that thick black line in between is one-way glass. So after talking about it, we came up with three different methods here for um, the introduction, the actual testing, and then the debrief. So in the introduction, the moderator, Zoe, and the participant would be in the room, but they would be six feet apart, and the note taker would be in the back room. So there would only be two people, socially distanced, six feet apart, um, and they wouldn't really have to worry or, or be too concerned about that. And then prior to coming into the room, uh, each participant, when they arrived early, if we were still working with them, uh, they would be placed into a waiting room that was socially distanced across the hall. Um, after the introduction, we began testing. So the moderator, Zoe, would then come out and into the observation room where um, myself and Zoe would just kind of be there and look through the one-way glass at the participant. So the participant had full range of the room. Um, because it was a different ventilation system and the door closed, the participant was actually able to remove their mask when they were testing. So there was no concern for fogging up the glass if they had the mask on. Uh, it, was, it was based on their comfort level. And then during the debriefing session, Zoe, the moderator, would go back in um, and socially distance again to ask questions and answer questions. During the testing phase, um, in order to communicate with the participant, we actually had, we, we finagled it because we didn't really have a lot of high-tech microphones. Uh, we had a laptop that had a WebEx going. Um, and that way we can communicate one way and to the participant and, and give them instructions. And then we also set up a microphone that could capture the whole room. So the participant could then talk into the microphone, go through the WebEx to us in the back room. So we had audio and we had a uh, video of what the participant was saying um, on the TV in the back. It was very important to understand this flow for us. So going step-by-step step was crucial in us understanding um, where the participant would be, where our comfort level would be, um, and how to identify any possible breakages in, in protocols. Then we get to the fun part of resetting the room. So where we used to change the camera batteries, change the cards, now we had to sanitize the whole room of, of any surfaces. So if the participant sat in a chair, we'd have to clean the entire chair, the doorknobs, the tables, um, anything that particles could possibly land on, we did a good wipe down um, with some wipes. And then of course, sanitizing the device. Uh, as Zoe said, we got that silicone thing that fit on the inside of the mask that was very easy to clean and dried very quickly. So we would just clean that, the buttons, um, the lenses, the back of the headset, anything that was in contact with the participant um, would be sanitized completely um, before the next participant got into the room. I'll hand it over to Zoe. All right. So um, while I'm really proud of all the barriers uh, that we put into place to make our testing sessions as safe as possible, we certainly learned quite a bit in the process. So one of the major takeaways for me is that COVID guidelines are changing all the time. Think back to April when we were walking around maskless and <laughs> wiping down our Dorito bags with Clorox wipes. <laughs> Uh, it was a different time it was under different guidelines and evidence now has suggested that you know masks are really really important and wiping down um, every little thing is, is less so um, and so 
when starting testing, it's really, really important to not just use the information you think you know about the pandemic, because you may be relying on old data. Even now we have this new strain of COVID and they're recommending you know, new double masking techniques. Things are changing all the time. If you're going to be asking people to come into a space and uh, it's your job to keep them safe, do a little research first and make sure that you understand the current protocols um, that will keep you and your participants safe. Uh, next, uh, implementing these guidelines made every aspect of usability testing longer than normal. Um, in the planning phase, we added time researching guidelines. Um, you know, it's something we wouldn't do in a normal year, but this was a project in 2020. Uh, buying supplies took time, first to identify the supplies we would need, but then also to find competitive prices for medical masks and sanitizing wipes that continue to be in such high demand. Um, we found that we had to pay higher prices for these items generally and that shipping took longer than normal. On top of that, we had to develop um, previously mentioned symptom checker. And then after it was developed, we had to run that up the organizational totem pole and make sure leadership gave their approval. Um, in testing, we need to give extra time for sanitizing the room and troubleshooting. And in the analysis, um, as Chris said, we had this extra step of digitizing all of these paper forms for analysis. Next, um, in addition to taking more time to complete the testing process, we also felt um, that we needed to be more time conscious. Um, for one, the longer we spent with each participant, the more potential there was for the virus to spread. And so it was, we thought it was really prudent to say, you know, testing session starts then and testing will end then. Even if we had a little bit that we didn't get to, um, our safety is more important and we were just gonna have to end the session on time and not finish it. Um, but also we didn't want our participants to run into one another um, or have multiple people sitting in our waiting room area. So social distancing was just much easier if we did this, um, if we ended sessions on time. Uh, next, troubleshooting was so much more difficult and took more time than usual. Uh, this is a little complicated to explain. Um, but the main thing that would go wrong during our study was that the casting to uh, the TV in the back was really important for us to be able to understand like how the participant was using the VR environment. Um, and so, but it would randomly turn off, <laughs> it would just randomly stop working or disconnect um, partially because of our bad Wi-Fi. Um, and we would no longer be able to see what the participant is seeing through the VR headset. Some participants were able to learn how to recast and we could just walk them through the steps, but this wasn't the case for everyone. We would have to go into the room, put on the headset, recast, and then put the headset on the participant again. But this created a massive hurdle of sanitizing the device between users. So whenever we had to troubleshoot this way, the device needed to be sanitized two times. Um, once after when the, uh, the moderator would take it from the participant, they had to clean it, then put it on and clean it again and give it back to the participant. Um, I see someone asking a really good question about a second device and theoretically that would work, but we couldn't go back to the point that they were in the program. It was like an hour long process and we couldn't like speed them up to halfway through. So it had to be the same device. <sighs> you can see this still makes my heart beat a little. <laughs> um, Certainly not every device is as complicated as VR in this respect, um, but thinking about how things might go wrong and anticipating um, how your safety measures will translate in those instances is really helpful, I think. Um, uh, and one great way to learn about how your safety measure plans translate to the real world is to actually try it out. So we decided to do a full dress rehearsal the days before testing. It was a huge help in identifying when our safety measures were likely to fail, and it gave us the opportunity to fix things and think about elements of the testing process we hadn't previously considered. Um, one of those for us was where participants would sit when they arrived early. Up until that point, we had assumed our normal area in the public reading room would suffice, but that area was highly trafficked and made social distancing really difficult. So we realized in dress rehearsal, we needed to rethink things and find a new space. Um, next, I'd like to talk about recruitment a little more since we didn't talk about that earlier. Um, and, and the main reason we didn't talk about it is because it ended up not being a problem for us. 
Um, but in our planning and, and maybe planning for future usability testing too, we did anticipate that recruitment might be difficult because people are anxious about the pandemic. Um, we were also concerned about transportation and whether or not people would be able to get to our offices. We're near a bus route and a metro line, but would people be willing to take public transportation? That we weren't sure. Um, like I said, we had no issues recruiting and it's hard to say exactly why that is. At least a few of our participants, unfortunately, had lost their jobs due to the pandemic. And so they were excited about the opportunity to you know, have a job and make money. Um, and so it was a, a boon to them. Um, but as the pandemic and the economy evolves, those factors impacting recruiting are gonna continue to change. And if we did the study again, I, I would still begin recruiting early just to be safe. Um, and on the next slide, personally, I did have some doubts about how participants would react to our safety measures. You know, there's been a lot of talk on the news and the internet about, you know, when measures are appropriate and what measures go too far. And so I was anticipating some amount of backlash, um, but we didn't get any. Uh, all of our participants were fine with the safety precautions and some expressed that it did make them feel more comfortable. Uh, one participant did want to uh, take an extra measure themselves, and they sanitized the mask themselves just to make sure they knew it was done uh, possibly. So generally, all of our safety precautions were really well received. Um, of all the guidelines, social distancing was the hardest to abide by. Uh, and this is for a lot of reasons. I think a lot of them had to do with how our building structured. As Chris said, we have this tiny, tiny elevator um, and our space isn't very big either. And really the viewing room is even smaller. So these are limitations we couldn't really control. And what that meant was that our other barriers became a lot more important. Mask wearing, hand washing, um, those became essential for when social distancing failed. Um, it also uh, made me have to rely on my colleagues a lot more. We could social distance with the participants most of the time, um, but between members of the usability team, it was really, really difficult. So we really had to trust each other to, to stay safe and take precautions outside of work and to only show up to work when we were feeling well. Um, and we ended up relying on each other that way. Um, even with social distancing being difficult, personally, I did feel safe throughout the entire process. I felt like we were taking all the proper precautions we needed to and that the small size of our research team and the small size of our participant pool, seven participants, um, made the testing sessions very, very safe. Um, I don't know, Chris, do you, do you wanna say anything about how you felt? Yeah, no, I was I was very, very comfortable. And of course, I mean, with all the news and, and everything that was going on, it was, it was a little nerve wracking, right? So having the, all of these precautions in place, first off, made me feel a lot, a lot better, but also just the complete transparency and, and planning on the part of the team um, was, was huge. Uh, there was never a step of the way that if something were to happen that I wouldn't know what to do. Um, and that was, that was great. It was very comforting to know that if something were to happen, I would know, you know, go to the next room or have them wear another mask or, or something like that. Um, and then you knew where all of the, the items were. So it was, it was very, very comforting to, to know that you had such a supportive team behind you, but also that the participant knew exactly what was going to happen that they knew the plan, they knew exactly what to do. They were told instructions uh, and they were given a heads up that we were taking these precautions. Um, so I think that was very, very helpful in, in making my comfort level kind of skyrocket. So that was, that was great. Awesome, thanks. Um, and the last thing I just wanna say is that every additional safety measure helps, you know? I, I wouldn't be a safety specialist if I didn't include the Swiss cheese model <laughs> in at least one of my slides. Um, but when one of your barriers fails, and inevitably one of them will fail, it's essential that you have other precautions in place to keep your participants and yourself safe while conducting, you know, high quality usability tests. So thank you so much for your time. Um, on the next slide, we have sort of our, our key takeaways from pandemic testing, because we know this was a lot of information, but these are the things that we would think about if we were doing uh, testing in a pandemic again. Um, and it's know your industry guidelines and how to protect against the virus, know your building policy or, or make your own, provide extra time to complete every step of the process, and I mean every step, um, maintain transparency between your team and um, 
uh, and your participants, design for safety and redundancy, and know what to do when breaks in protocol happen. Um, that's it for our presentation, and we're really happy to answer any questions. I saw a ton of them uh, fly by when we were presenting. Um, Uh, that is fantastic. Thank you uh, so much. Let me uh, go ahead and we've actually had a bunch of questions come in here. Let's go ahead and uh, I'll just I'll just start at the the top of the list here. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to put my own questions to the side because I'm 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 <laughs> pretty fascinated. Um, but so first, from Sam Bartley uh, is asking, did you use an external recruiter or do you have your own recruiter for finding participants? We use an external recruiter. Um, and we relied a lot on them to uh, give us feedback on, on how they expected recruitment to go. And that was really helpful. So when we got in touch with them, they, they did give us information like uh, get ex uh, give yourself extra time, prepare to increase the incentive. Um, we didn't end up needing to do that, um, but those, that was helpful to have an outside recruiter to tell us those things. That, that was our next question. If uh, uh, Amy you know, asks if you've... Uh... And to increase participant compensation. I'm sure it would have helped, but uh, yeah, apparently we we got lucky with the with what we had to to provide them. So um, I think that was really helpful, and the the fact that the recruiter actually contacted each participant 24 hours beforehand to run through those symptom checker questions as well. Um, it kind of added that extra layer of of confirmation that you know these participants were you know truthful in, in what they were saying. Very cool. Um, next up, uh, Lucy asks, are there any protocol changes that you found so effective that you would take them with you post pandemic? That is um, an excellent question. A difficult question, but an excellent question. I think, I think one of the main things is we did the full dry run for the first time. And when I say dry run, I don't just mean like going through the moderator guide. I mean like um, we had our colleague Robin stand at the front door and <laughs> greeted her when she came in, <laughs> uh, kind of dry run. And that was incredibly helpful for us um, because we were able to, to catch things like, like the waiting room dilemma um, that we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and so that's something I definitely hope to do again um, to make our process as streamlined as possible. Cool. Uh, so next up, uh, David Keith is asking, were there additional waivers for liability that were added to the recruitment forms? I don't think there were. Yeah. I, I only hesitate <laughs> because uh, uh, there were uh, there was um, the new symptom checker and some other new paperwork, but but no, there I don't think there was any personal liability. Yeah. I Great think it was early. Though. I think it was early on uh, enough to the point where uh, we weren't too concerned about liability at that point. Um, but the fact that we were were taking all these precautions um, really helped in, in making them aware of those. Excellent. And uh, I'll just jump back to to one of my questions. So, so was there any biohazard suits involved in like going into the testing? Because I, I <laughs> that's the image that I was really hoping for. <laughs> but, no, no biohazard suits. Um, we all wore masks um, and hand sanitized like crazy, but uh, that was about it. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Asha, and also I want to thank uh, uh, Asha Singh, who is our, our also on the board of UXPA DC and, and was the organizer of the DCUX conference um, and is, is, has been moderating and, and checking the questions. Um, she's asked if the pandemic impacted the demographics of the participants. So, you know, for example, did it did it seem like it removed the ability to have any at risk age groups or, you know, or, or other groups that that you might typically see participate? That's a great question. So I can't say too much about this because of the NDA, but our participant group was an at risk group for COVID. Um, and uh, we did not have have trouble recruiting. Like I said before, a, a couple of our participants, um, when we were just chatting with them in downtime, said that they had lost their jobs due to COVID. And so they were picking up odd jobs around just to make money. Um, and so I think 
I think it's some balance of like fear of COVID and status of the economy and tons of other things that really play into recruiting. And um, at the specific time that we recruited and for the specific group, we didn't have problems. Gotcha. Um, Sam Bartley asks, how long did it take you to plan out the process from end to end? Ooh, I would say maybe weeks, a couple weeks before yeah. um, starting. Um, like week one, we, our first meeting was, okay, what protocols do we need to figure out? What do we need to research? That was, um, that was after the, are we doing this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> first question at that meeting was, are we comfortable doing this? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, we went to the, the protocols and then we broke up and, and, you know, figured out, okay, what are, is the correct guidance? And then we came together and created that layout of the room. Um, and you know the questions and the symptom checker. Um, so it was it was a couple weeks um, before we even um, started the dry runs, um, and then from there we we learned even more. So um, I think about maybe two two or three weeks, I'd say. So so a lot of these things about if if you know again just kind of count on things taking a little bit longer with these additional like some some of the questions you know you just don't know that you even need to ask yet. And that that can add to it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so one question that I have, and, and it's it's sort of a question that I've had to every time I've gone to a doctor's office, or you know, you know, in you know during this period, um, was anybody actually turned away as a result of the the questionnaire of the 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 symptom checker? No, no, no one was. It does make you wonder. It does. It does. <laughs> And I, you know, I, I often just like, like the, the, the UX researcher and me too, like whenever I go to the doctor, it's, you know, I'm kind of always asking like, like, so has anybody ever been turned away and they're just like, you know, they'll either, they either won't say or, or they'll say no. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think this comes back to like, uh, no one's, you can't rely on any one step. Um, you just gotta, you gotta layer it like that cheese. <laughs> <Just gotta. laughs> Every layer of protection helps. Um, from Alexandra Grinman, uh, are you planning any more evaluations in the upcoming weeks or months? Uh, and will there be any additional measures to take based on the experiences that, that, that you've learned so far? Yeah, I think we will be doing more usability testing probably in the next two to three months. Um, and I think one thing I want to look into more is like the aerosolization of particles and specifically like what's happening in our room. Um, is there some sort of like air purifier we can get to make us safer or changing some aspect of the ventilation? I know this is getting really nitpicky, but you can tell I'm a safety person. Yeah. <laughs> no risks in, a, in our usability lab. Would, um, you, would, you, would you expect to require uh, double masks? Oh like yeah, probably. Um, especially with this new variant that seems to be the new guideline that's coming out. And uh, maybe biohazard suits? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I might consider it. I'm, I guess, I guess actually, you know, maybe just hopeful it doesn't get to that level of... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> um, we would probably add a new question on our surveys about whether or not people have had a vaccine oh, sure. um, and maybe prioritize um, uh, members of our team who have had vaccines to actually conduct the in-person testing. Um, that's something we might do. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Um, Sean Chan asks, has there been any participants who are uh, resistant to the safety precautions? And, you know, if so, how did you handle it? Or if not, like, how, how would, did you make any preparations on how you would uh, handle that if that were to come up? Yeah, it would have been a very uncomfortable conversation. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we didn't have anyone who was resistant to the protocol, but uh, there wouldn't have been any any wiggle room. They would have just had to go. Gotcha. And do you, do you have things like like security or or like like things that you could you know bring in if something were to? We do. We have building security. Um, Asha asks, uh, in theory, if you were to do another round, would you explore providing partial incentivization for participants with symptoms? or exposure to uh, discourage falsehoods? I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, I'm gonna, 
Let me see. Asha, up, up. Let me go ahead and go off mute. Hi. 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 Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, the thought process being, if you didn't have this, you said, but if someone were to have symptoms or you know develop them or have exposure leading up to the testing time frame, um, with partial incentivization, I feel like it could discourage lying just to get the money, especially if they lost their job. So I know it's a theoretical question since you didn't run into that issue. Um, I'm just curious on your thoughts on that, that approach. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking that, I guess the reason I'm confused is I don't know how I would know if they were lying. <laughs> um, that's all. Uh, uh, so even if they did have COVID and we wouldn't know unless one of us got sick, I don't think. Um, and then we wouldn't know who. Yeah. Yeah. So I love the idea of, of um, finding ways to, to make people more honest, but uh, um, we're in a tricky situation with COVID for sure. Gosh, that's, it's very nerve wracking. Like I can't even, I don't know, can't even imagine. One of the things that really, another thing that really made me comfortable was um, I went to uh, one of our hospitals recently and uh, our COVID precautions were way stricter than the hospitals. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it gave me some, some, uh, uh, some relief because I know the, the people at the hospital uh, know what they're doing. Um, so that made me think we were, we were likely protected the whole time. Um, uh, Sam Bartley asks, uh, did you also plan out the event of someone reporting symptoms after the test? So if somebody, you know, came home the next day and started to, to be symptomatic, did they have a way to get in touch or a protocol they were asked to follow? No, we never thought about that. Yeah. And that's an excellent idea. <laughs> um, that is an absolutely fantastic idea because um, I can, you know, I can imagine um, if that were to happen, we would need to contact everyone we'd been in contact with and that person had been in contact with in our building um, just to make sure people were aware and they were safe. Um, I'm going to throw in one question uh, myself too that I was just kind of wondering from the very beginning. Um, with, with the participants, if you can, if you can say, were these people that had prior VR experience, or was this people that 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 weren't familiar with the platform, or the type, or even like were these first-time VR users that needed a lot? Of, like I, I'm I'm trying to think of all the times I've had to onboard somebody into VR, and I can't even imagine doing that from another room. Uh, so I was curious about that side of it. Chris, do you want to take this one? <laughs> sure. That, <laughs> that was it. Was a major pain point. Um, we did have participants that, that had VR experience before, and then there were those who had never touched a VR headset in their life. Um, and so it became somewhat evident at the, at the very beginning um, that, you know, there was a, a struggle area with, with that. Um, I think it was after the first participant um, that didn't have a lot of VR experience. We figured out, okay, we need to set up this headset and basically be the ones to hand them the headset they put it on and they're immediately in the environment. We basically just need to tell them how to restart the recording. Um, so the less steps that we can take uh, in order to get them to where they need to be to start the testing, the better for us. So that was basically making sure that you're standing in the right spot and you're right in front of that screen where you, all you have to do is lift the remote and, and press record. Um, and then wiping down that headset entirely and handing it to them so that they can take it from there. Um, and then the, we did have to do a lot of verbal instructions um, from the from the observation room, um, where we could see, you know, they were facing the wrong way, or they were too close to something, or or something else, um, where we just kind of gave them instructions. Uh, it also gave us the ability to to test them in that sense of, you know, was you know, the the app doing its job kind of thing. Um, so those were kind of my experiences with with that kind of onboarding, which is, it, it is a struggle. It's a learning process, especially with VR. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And and I just, I think, I think in the go, no go decision, I would have been kind of like, well, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, may, I may have uh, uh, waited on that. But, yeah. but 
Sorry, we have the naivety of never having done a, a VR test before. Right? <laughs> exactly. We're normally doing like um, some weird medical device. Yeah. And we're like, oh, VR, that'll be fine. Yeah, and patience <laughs> is crucial. Little did we know. Did you say was was the platform the Oculus Quest? The, mm -hmm. the yeah. So, so did did the Quest being sort of a standalone device? Did that make it any easier? Uh, I would say the biggest problem we ran into were the controls. Um, yeah. yeah, people just didn't know how to use them unless yeah. they'd had experience before. Um, and uh, if they didn't have experience, they weren't going to figure it out. <laughs> not, did. Not... Oh, go ahead. No, we, we had the luxury of, of being able to set up that the whole Guardian system. Um, and it was a blessing that it remembered the Guardian system for, for each device. Um, that really made it uh, a difference when they put that on so that they didn't you know, run into a wall or get bloody knuckles or something. So no, one one of the, the you know the big topics in in sort of the UX of of uh, in, in interaction patterns associated with the quest, you know, we're we're seeing a lot of really cool stuff happening now with sort of hand tracking. Um, was that is there? Do you think like an opportunity in future research to eliminate the controls issue and and maybe do more with with hand interactions? Oh, you're going way beyond me, but. <laughs> That sounds incredible. It sounds so much better because that's two less things that we have to sanitize next time. I mean, I think I think it really well. Yeah, absolutely. It, it speaks to sort of the promise of of you know all of these devices, the Hololens, you know, the 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 you know hand tracking. All of it is geared towards this idea of a more natural computing experience where they're, you know, you know, you still, you know, there's still benefit to that fine control with the controllers, but but uh, that that seems like it could be really. You know, you know, definitely would be curious to see how that, like, if that, you know, how much easier that could make life. Uh, in the uh, let's see. Um, so Sam Bartley asks, are we allowed to ask what age group uh, the participants were? So we're allowed to ask, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, there were uh, uh, no restrictions on age group other than over 18. And so I think our range was 28 to 69. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, uh, Min asks, would you differentiate participants who had only had one dose of vaccine versus the full two doses? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, they are showing that the, the first dose is, is getting people up to that, you know, 80% or so protective. Um, I think that's definitely something we can consider in, in the future. Um, it, I mean, two is better than one, of course. Um, but when it does come down to that, I think that's something that you'd have to come back to the team to discuss um, and make sure that, you know, if somebody does only have one shot and, you know, they're out of that two day period to three day period where it's almost up to full immunity, um, are you comfortable with that? Then, you know, you can have a team discussion and make sure that everybody's on the same page before, before going forward. But that, that is definitely a, a talking point and something interesting. Um, as we go forward, you know, learning about this vaccine, the, the implementation of them and, and how well they work. Very cool. Uh, do we have any other questions? I know we're, we're, we're a little over time, but I um, want to see going once, going twice. All right. Well, thank you both so much for, for putting this presentation together for us and, and this insight into some very exciting, you know, UX and 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 VR, like I'm I'm in heaven here. This is like, for me, this is worlds colliding. That makes me so happy. Um, but um, yeah, thank you very much for putting this together and for taking the time to share this with us uh, today. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting us, and thanks to everyone for all of your great questions. You thought of things that had never crossed my mind, then we're going to make some better usability testing for, for it. So. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll uh, we'll make the recording of this available on the UXPDC website, and and yes, uh, thank you again, Media Barn, for for helping us make this possible. We're really excited about, you know, you know the coming up the year coming up, the mentorship program, uh, our spring portfolio review is going to be coming back. Uh, you know, we're we're you know we're we're, we're going to be all online for the foreseeable future, but you know, you know this we we feel like we're off to a great start here, and uh, and looking forward to 2021. So with that, I'll go ahead and say good night and uh, thanks again, everybody. <laughs>